Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where you, we talk about all things steampunk, especially steampunk fiction. Today my topic combines two of my passions, steampunk and anime, that is Japanese animation. You know people say, you're adults, why do you watch cartoons? Because they're great. I'm going to do my top 10 now, I'm going to start with 10 as usual. And so, here goes, my top 10 greatest steampunk related anime. Number 10, Steam Detectives, 1988, was based, yeah right, 1998 to 1999, based on a manga by Kia Asamiya, which I have mentioned in my steampunk comics episode, and uh, the anime was directed by Nobuyoshi, Nobuyoshi Habara, Studio Zebek, and uh, this one barely made the cut. I it was a bit cheesy for my taste, and I just liked the manga a fair quite a bit, so I had to include it. And the this takes place in fictional Steam City, which is very smoky. So because of the obscured vision, it's a haven for criminals. The protagonist is a is boy detective Narutaki, and his lively near sidekick Ling Ling. Narutaki is very reminiscent of Batman. He's a young a young man who's um, parents were murdered by criminals and he fights crime. The dialogue and characters can be kind of silly on this one, some of the villains especially. Uh, also reminiscent of Batman. The animation is kind of an early 90s style, but I would rate this at least three gears, if not three and a half out of five. Number nine, a very new one. It's, it's currently being being uh, broadcast. A Party Ranman 2020. Based on a manga by Masakazu Hashimoto, uh, the director is the same person, which is cool. Like how he's got his control of his product. Uh, Studio's PA works, and this involves a young inventor named Apare. He's from a noble family, but he's kind of a black sheep because they don't like his tinkering. They want him to do normal uh, aristocrat stuff, and his uh, samurai handler, who they've uh, hired, families hired to keep track of him and keep him out of trouble, Kusame. Anyway, they go off on uh, Pari's experimental steamship and end up in America, stranded. <laughs> they don't have money to get back to Japan, and uh, they decide to enter this um, auto race uh, across America from, from Los Angeles to New York. Uh, and this is supposedly your 1900s, so they're gonna, there's no roads. So, so it it's promises to be a very wacky series. And... Uh, Indeed, it, indeed, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, my main problems with this is Apare's character design is a little too kooky for me. For 1900, he's got this crazy hair and it's, he wears a pink kimono and <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and the, um, some of the other drivers, some of the other vehicles are anachronistic. They look like they're from 1930s and 40s and so, uh, and, and, and even 50s. So. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's going to be fun. I, the, the, I've only seen the, the first two episodes so far, which is all that's in broadcast, but I had to include it. Number eight, another one from this year, and that's encouraging because they're coming out with all this great steampunk in the present year. Fantastic. Drifting Dragons uh, in uh, Japanese, Kutai Doraganzu, <laughs> which means, I think, Airborne Dragons, and is based on a uh, manga by Taku. Kuwabara, and the director of the anime is Tadahiro Yoshihira Polygon Pictures. And it involves a young woman named Tak Takita, who joins the crew of the Queen Zaza, which is a uh, dragon hunting, aka draking vessel. They call it draking. It's an airship, and these dragons float in the sky, they're like whales of the air. And they're very intelligent, and they're, they're very weird, and they're not they're like your normal uh, fire-breathing dragon. Some I do breathe fire, but most of them don't. And uh, so they um, they hunt and kill these giant dragons. They eat them. <laughs> they they sell the meat. They they sell the oil. They they sell the hides. And uh, it's 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 cool. They've got this airship has this cool eccentric group with with cool characters. And they, they love Takita. She's kind of their mascot. It's mostly male, but there are, are a few women. And uh, I kind of like how they were very realistic about the hunting angle. I mean, they kill these animals, I and mean, sometimes it's kind of sad. And uh, there wasn't as much of an overall character arc 
arc. Although Takeda does kind of grow as a draker, <laughs> even though she has misgivings occasionally by killing these things. Number seven. This one's more of a diesel punk, The Last Exile, and its sequel, A Fan the Silver Wing. Uh, original one, 2003, sequel 2011, based on a manga by Gonzo. Love that name. Director Koichi Chigata from the studio Gonzo. Hmm, interesting connection. Uh, the, um, this is, like I said, it's kind of diesel punk style. It's set in the fictional world of Prester, where they have these magnetic powered airships that kind of float in the air. And uh, they have these two nations that are at war. And uh, it's kind of, there's a lot of scarcity, including scarcity of water. These orphans, Klaus and Lavi, are the main protagonists. And they, uh, their, their fathers had this courier service. The fathers are killed, uh, but they inherit the, the airship, so they start their own courier service because their mothers are gone as well. They, involved, they end up involved in the war and, and hook up with this battleship, Savannah, another airship, and which is kind of like their kind of a rogue ship that belongs to neither nation. And... Uh, and the cool, one of the cool things is that there's this other group called the Guild, and they're kind of super advanced, almost alien technology. They're kind of cyberpunk, and they kind of watch over and manipulate the nations. The sequel involves Fam and her bestie Giselle, who are teenage girls who are sky pirates. I didn't find that believable at all. <laughs> you have to have a credible threat of violence to hijack a sh an airship, right? And it takes place on Earth, where the uh, colonists have tried to come back, and the Earth Earthers don't want them back. <laughs> so they have that that theme. But it's in any case, it's 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 beautiful like the others. So even though it isn't as good, I still recommend it. Number six, Cabernet of the Iron Fortress, or Kotetsujo no Cabernet, 2016, based on a manga by Shiro Yoshida. The director is Tetsuro Araki, and this is from Wit Studio. And the setting is Japan, or a Japan-like nation <laughs> during the Industrial Revolution, probably like the Meiji era. And uh, the problem these people have is there's a virus that turns people into Gabane, which are very much like zombies. They're these mindless, bloodthirsty creatures that, that attack you and spread the virus. And this has overrun the country, and the survivors live in these fortress-like stations, and they travel in fortified steam locomotives, so that's very cool tech. And, in, and there's this young inventor named Ikoma who has just created a steam gun that can kill the Kabane reliably because they're tough to kill. You have to behead them otherwise. And, but he is attacked and infected and just to stop the infection using a tourniquet of all things, stop the infection from reaching his brain and he becomes this mutant called the Kabane, which means he has advanced powers even though the humans now hate and mistrust him. He's still killing Kabane. Kind of like, he's kind of like the blade of the uh, Kabani world. And, and he teams up with this uh, Kabaneri girl called Mume, who appears to know martial arts. And I haven't gotten through this, but it looks, it looks to be pretty good. Number five, Lapu L Laputa, Castle in the Sky, 1986, by the great Hayao Miyazaki, wrote and directed. Studio Ghibli, of course, and uh, very much a classic. There's this young orphan girl named Shita, and she's abducted by this government agent, Muska, and they're taking her away on an airship. Of course, it involves an airship. They're attacked by Captain Dola, who's this kind of crazy old lady, and her air pirates. And uh, they, they, some of them seem to be her family. They, they're, they're fun. They're a lot of fun. And uh, in, the, in the process, though, Shita falls off the airship, uh, survives miraculously, <laughs> is rescued by this orphan boy, Pazu, who was working in the mines, and his late father believed in this floating city called Lapita, and he has a photograph of it. And, and, uh, and she just says, wow, that's my last name. <laughs> Must be a connection. So they go looking for this, and, uh, and eventually they find it. It's been deserted, and it's kind of in ruins, but it's still floating. And, of course, the government's after, after the weapons that are here in the city, and the pirates are after the treasure. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what happens, but, but it's... It's, it's an exciting adventure uh, with these two. And, uh, and again, the, the, characters, the characters are multidimensional. They're not all, not all good or evil. Number four. This, is, this may be controversial, but I think it's steampunk. Or at least dieselpunk. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. It's a very popular anime based on a 
2009-10 manga by Hiromu Arakawa. Uh, screenwriter, I, b I believe the screenwriter of the, uh, the uh, anime, was Hiroshi Onogi and the director Yashihiro Arai Iri. 64 episodes, I watched them all. I love this. Uh, it involves two brothers, uh, Edward and Alphonse Elric. They are born into an alchemist family, and alchemy is this skill that is very prized. You know, uh, changing, transmuting, transmuting metals and, and, and any material actually, and and you, it's kind of like magic <laughs> in this case. And uh, there's this rule though of equivalent exchange: you must pay a price for everything that you do. Their mother dies. Their father deserts them. Their mother dies in a, fe in a of a fever. And they try to resurrect her, and uh, that backfires because resurrecting the dead is a very costly thing, and that's which is why it's forbidden. And uh, Ed, um, Edward loses an arm and a leg, literally, have to be replaced by clockwork, I guess. And the uh, brother, his body goes away entirely, but Edward is able to fix Alphonse's soul to the suit of armor, so he looks like this giant robot. And just the loyalty and the love between these brothers is very touching, but they, being brothers, they fight a lot too, which is also which is also makes makes it entertaining. The brothers are searching for their bodies because there's this afterworld that I, they think they can get Alphonse's body from, and uh, they're also fighting these homunculi, which personify the seven deadly sins. Sins. One of them is is the leader of their country, Amnistris. <laughs> And he's the, actually the president. People don't know this at first. So I'm going to give that away. This will just draw you in and you won't be able to stop watching it. It's, it's amazing. Number three. This is something that Mrs. Desperado and I did uh, uh, an entire video on. We love it so much. Howl's Moving Castle. 2004, again, by the great Hayao Miyazaki, Studio Ghibli. Based on a book by British fantasy writer Diana Wynne-Jones from 1986. And this is the, he really changed it because it was kind of a fantasy that involved the, in this alternate dimension and uh, this wizard Howl, he was actually from our dimension. <laughs> uh, he was actually from our world, uh, but uh, Miyazaki makes it into kind of a steampunk. And where it's happening in this uh, fictional world with the early 1900s and they have these, these uh, biplanes that are battling each other, there's a war, and... Uh, Howell has this castle that he animated and it walks around these giant um, mechanical legs that kind of look like chicken legs. And he is, he can change to a bird and he tries to stop this war. At the same time, we have Sophie, who was a lovely young girl who was a hat maker, and she is transformed into an old woman by a curse from the Witch of the Wastelands. Witch of the Waste. And she takes, she takes refuge with Howell, who doesn't want her around. But she's cooking and cleaning for him, so um, so uh, he allows her to stay. And it's kind of like an an unlikely love develops, and so on. And and it, it's it's pretty cool, very touching. Number two, here we're getting to some of the hardcore steampunk. Steam Boy, 2004, and a great two-hour movie, written by Sadayaki Mirai and and Katsuhiro Otomo. You may have heard of him because he also did, and he directed this as well. He also did Akira. The very famous, one of the most beloved animes of all time, groundbreaking, when the, the company is Sunrise. Premise: In 19, in, excuse me, in 1863, we have the Steam family, which is kind of amusing. The Steam family, Loyal, Lloyd and son Edward, who are steam engineers, and they're they're experimenting in the Arctic with this, trying to find this ultra pure water. Edward gets trapped in the ice, and the Grandfather goes on to in, the father goes on to invent uh, this amazing steam ball, which it's a way of it's a little metal ball that stores all this energy in the form of steam, and uh, he sends this to his grandson Ray, who's working as a mechanic at a uh, factory in Manchester, and uh, and it's because the people are trying to steal this invention from him. And this this a nefarious O'Hara Foundation, uh, kind of like Soros. <laughs> no, uh, no, O'Hara Foundation is um, trying to steal this, and they because they want to they want these weapons that are going to sell them to the Great Britain's enemies. They're they're treacherous, and uh, they um, 
And at the same time, uh, young Ray Steen meets uh, the lovely young Scarlett O'Hara, <laughs> yes, named after that character. She's beautiful, she's bright, and she's very spoiled and arrogant, but she, she, she gets, she improves <laughs> and uh, kind of falls for, for Ray. And they have these uh, struggles, these battles with cool steampunk uh, tanks and so on. And uh, the real life character, um, uh, Robert Stevenson, not the writer, but the engineer, uh, from 18, 1800s Britain, and uh, just as steampunk as you can get. Very, very awesome and amazing. Number one, Empire of Corpses, aka Shisha no Taikoku. Uh, 2015, it's a two-hour movie. It's based on the sci-fi novel the Empire of Corpses by Project Ito, the, the late uh, the late um, sci-fi writer from Japan, uh, he died in his 30s of cancer, very tragic, but a brilliant guy, and uh, his co-writer To Enjo. And uh, the, this movie was directed by Ryutaru Makihara, by, uh, from Wit Studio. And this takes place in alternate, alternate England, in which Victor Frankenstein has invented a way to reanimate corpses with an artificial soul, which they call Necroware. <laughs> and it's kind of developed by Charles Babbage, yeah, that early computer guy. And by Victorian times, the undead are used as unthinking laborers and they revolutionize technology. It's kind of like they're kind of like slaves that don't have to, that, are, that will never revolt on you. And it's kind of revolutionized the economy. And uh, this is full of real life characters like Babbage, uh, U.S. President U.S. Grant, uh, Thomas Edison, but not Tesla, surprisingly enough. There's lots of um, uh, fictional characters from that era as well. Uh, John Watson, who's a protagonist, is, we find out later, the Mr. The Dr. Watson <laughs> uh, from the Sherlock Holmes. Um, Frankenstein, of course, his monster. Uh, the Brothers Karamazov from the Dostoevsky novel. And... Uh, there's, and some of the characters are named after characters from Ian Fleming's James Bond, which is kind of odd <laughs> and anachronistic, but nonetheless cool. And so anyway, Watson is, he's an, he's an agent of the British Empire, and he's tasked with, tasked with um, finding the lost notes of Dr. Frankenstein, which, which has got all these secrets about animating the dead. And uh, his assistant was his best friend Friday, who died and he reanimated and tried to bring him completely back to life, but he's still he's still kind of one of these mindless corpses that is his assistant, which is kind of this tragedy that, that it goes on through there. He um, encounters the brothers Karamazov who are involved in this conspiracy, and there's, I mean, there's everybody's trying to do things with these secrets, and uh, some people want him to destroy the secrets, others want the secrets for themselves, and there's this mysterious character, the One who has these ties to Dr. Dr. Frankenstein. It's kind of interesting who the one turns out to be. And the one has this, these very sinister plans for mankind, just, and Watson has to stop them. You're kind of at the edge of your seat, you kind of want to bite your fingernails, even if you've never done it, because it's, it's, so, it's so exciting, and it's also very beautiful animation, even though it's kind of dark. So, that is my top 10 list. Uh, let me know what you think. Are there others that I missed? Did you hate any of the ones that I mentioned? Did you think they shouldn't be steampunk? <laughs> Let me know. And uh, also, thank you for joining me. Please like and subscribe because it helps us get out the good gospel of steampunk to the masses. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.